Let's go ahead and turn to the book of Joel. Joel. This may be a little book, but it is a powerful little book. It has three little chapters, but within its three little chapters, it is amazing how much is there. Now, the book of Joel, in it you're going to find that it speaks of a plague of locusts swarming over the land. That's how it opens up with a plague of locusts coming in and just swarming over the land and devastating it. I mean, demolishing it, destroying it, just, just utterly leaving nothing behind. Almost describes like four waves of them coming in and just eating everything in sight. And, and what it is, it is used to predict the future. The judgment that God's going to bring on Judah. That's what it's about. And it does, it, it, it is about judgment and harsh judgment. And you think, well, how can you be excited about that? Because that ain't where it ends. It ends in God restoring to them all that has been just taken from them. It is pretty amazing when you get a hold of it. We're going to see that God, although He takes from them, He's going to restore to them. It is a call to repent. It is a call for them to repent. You know, God's not, God's not a God of wrath. Yes, He's a God of wrath. I mean, technically, He's a God of wrath. He's a God of love. He's a God of anger. He's a God of everything. You understand what I'm saying? He is 100% pure love. But at the same time, He's holy and 100% just. Yep. And cannot look upon sin. And has to judge it. Amen? Amen. But it's not His will to go around and just send lightning bolts. He's not sitting on the throne with his finger sharp and ready to point it at somebody and zap them. Does it make sense? That's not what he wants to do. He wants to bless. He wants to uh, uh, fellowship with us. But we've got to repent. We've got to turn from our sin. We've got to get things right. Amen? So that's basically one of the lessons we'll get out of this book. But it is, it is amazing. And again, Joel, there's very little known of Joel. In verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel. The only thing we know about Joel is his father. And we don't even know who his father is. There's nothing in there about his father. So he, he's uh, basically unknown. Very little is known of him. And then I got to thinking about that and I thought, that's good too. That's good too. Because see, we knew so much about Hosea. Hosea, we just studied him and we know about his wife and his children and how he named them and God told him to marry her and what she did for a living and how she messed up. We knew more about him than we should have known. But here, Joel, we don't know anything about him. Why? Because Joel wasn't about Joel. Joel was about the Word of God. Joel wanted to get the Word out. So when his, he opens up, look at verse 2. Of chapter 1, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Have this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? He takes off just telling them like it is. He's not worried about who he is. You know, it's not important who I am. It's not important who you are. What's important is who you know. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior? Are you, one that, are you a child of the King? That's what matters. That's what matters. You go in a lot of churches today and you can know all about the preacher. Know all about him. Know all about his family. Know about this. Know about that. But you ought to, but, but it's a sad state when you know all about the preacher but you leave and you don't know nothing about the Lord. When you tell all about the preacher but you don't know nothing about the Bible. Amen? Amen. Either the pastor's failed or you failed in getting the message. If all you get is something about the preacher. Amen. Now a lot of times preachers use their testimonies. And they give their testimonies. A lot of times I said this before. Sometimes I believe y'all could tell y'all y'all could tell my testimony like it was your own. I've told it so many times. I, June 29th. Amen. It was 7.30 on a Tuesday afternoon. The Lord saved me. You know. I, I tell that over and over. And it's not that I'm bragging on me. Because it's not what I did. It's what he did for me. 
I'm bragging on him when I do that. Amen. So yeah, you're going to know some things about me, but hopefully you realize the most important thing in my life is the Lord. Amen. Amen. But anyway, there's Joel. I, I like Joel. Let's go ahead and look at chapter 2 and verse 1. That's where I wanted to open up, but I just jumped in because I'm out of time this morning. It's already flying by. Joel chapter 2, look at verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rent your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and, and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. And again, verse 13, there's something just jumped out at me and it is a blessing if you get a hold of it. Look at verse 13 again. And rent your heart, not your garments. A lot of people put on the external show, but man, their heart's far from him. They worship him with their lips, but their heart's not there. Are you with me? They rent their garments. You remember how the Pharisees were? They were all about the show. They would rent when something bothered them. They'd rent their clothes showing how they were grieving, how they were distressed and all that stuff. It was an outward show. God said, I, I don't want the outward show. I don't want you putting on pretend. I don't want you playing Christian. I want your heart. Rent your heart, not your clothes. You know what I mean? That's what matters to him. Because a lot of people can put on a show. Jesus looked at a bunch of religious people and said, you whited wall sepulchers. They were all pretty on the outside, painted up white, whitewashed, you know, like, I guess that was what, John Sawyer, Tom Sawyer? Yeah, and the white horse fit. Everything was all pretty, but inside, just full of dead men bones. Amen. But anyway, God wants our heart, not our show. If that makes any sense. All right, now let's go ahead and jump into this. Now, what I wanted to point this out to you again is Joel is sometime around 800. Now, remember, Jesus is zero. We're here at 2024. We're right here at the... Probably getting ready to leave at the rapture, amen. But but Joel, he he serves in this time period here. Uh, he is to the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And about the same time, they say he was probably a contemporary. There's some controversy because there's not a whole lot told about him, so he was kind of hard to date. So from what he talks about, internal evidence, they try to conclude that he was sometime during the time of... <clears throat> Elisha. You had Elijah and Elisha who, who are prophets. They didn't write any books, but they were prophets to the northern tribes. So it would have been during that time that Joel came on the scene. And he's predicting some things that goes way out here into the future. And we'll get there in a second. But let me go ahead and give you the particulars that I normally give you. The particulars. That'll be number one. And then under that, you can put the, the, the author, of course, is Joel. Uh, then you can put the date of the book. It's sometime around 800 B.C. And then you can keep going. And you can talk about his ministry, how his ministry was to the southern tribes. But the historical context, if you want to know roughly what was going on, 2 Kings... 2 Kings chapter 12 and 2 Chronicles chapters 22 through 24 would have been roughly what was going on historically. Because remember, I showed you the chart how the historical books takes us all the way through the Old Testament. And then these prophets, they go back and give us it again. The problem is they're not in chronological order. So you have to kind of file them where they go. Put them where they go. Read who was the king. Find out what time they were prophesying and what, who, which tribe they were to. And when you start lining them up, it starts making sense. You can see what was going on historically in that time period and what God was saying to them. Okay. Now, the key phrase, the key phrase is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Here, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Look in uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Alas, 
For the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. There's the first time you see that expression in the book of Joel, the day of the Lord. But look, check, look down at chapter 2, verse 1. Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain and let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. Again, he's making a reference to the day of the Lord. Now look at verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great. For he is strong and executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Look at verse 31. In verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness. And the moon into blood. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Look at chapter 3 and verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Notice how it talked about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And you know what it's describing in context? It's describing the latter part of the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the second advent. That's what is being described by the day of the Lord. And that's the entire context of Joel. And that will come to play importance in just a little bit. Okay, I believe the key chapter is chapter 2. Because in chapter 2, he does call for Judah to repent. I, I read the, that, those verses there in chapter 2, verses 12 through uh, 14 there, you see God calling them to repent, to repent, to turn from their sin. I was going to preach on this uh, because, I, 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 and I still may sometime, but I, I, want to, I want to go ahead and just give it to you because it, it's going to fit right here too. Uh, you know, several years ago I preached on the prodigal son and we, we had the theme, you know, uh, the vacation Bible school, staying on the farm. It was about the prodigal son and all that stuff, staying on the farm. I preached a series of, I think, about eight messages out of that. And I thought I had covered every area you could think of. I even had one message out of that entitled, Where's Mama? Because Mama's not even mentioned in the passage. And I talk about Mama's being absent today in the life of their kids and the impact it has. But I, I mean, I thought I'd covered every area. And then something hit me when I was reading through the other day. You know why the prodigal came home? Do you know why he came home? Who can tell me why they think the prodigal son came home? Give me an idea. Somebody just tell me. Yes, ma'am. The whole pen was miserable, wasn't it? The whole pen was miserable. He was down there and he was feeding swine as low as you can get as a Jew. You're feeding swine for the heathen and, and you're taking care of this nasty beast. You smell like this nasty beast. And if you've never been around a pig, pigs don't smell pretty. Okay? They, they, they stink. They, they, they do. They stink. You can dress them up and put a bow on them and have them in your house if you want to. They stink. Pot belly and all, they all stink. Amen. But anyway, he came home because he realized this is stupid. I was so much better off at home. I had it so much better at home. I had it so much better when I had a loving father that cared for me and took care of me. I had it so much better when I had my family and my friends around me. I was so much better off at home than I am in this pig pen. But you know what we've done today? We've got kids that's going out into the pig pen. Mm -hmm. But instead of letting them wallow in their misery, you know what we've doing? You know what we're doing? We went and air conditioned the whole pen today. We run to the rescue every time they mess up. We excuse their every shortcoming. We make it to where you need to celebrate your whole pen. 
Is that not what we're doing today? They're not going to repent as long as we are conditioned that hog pen. They're not going to turn from their sin as long as we are justifying it for them. Judah's in a mess. He's telling them what's coming. And he's saying, repent. He's not our condition in the whole pen. He's telling them, it stinks and you're going to be in a mess. So we don't need to take the flame out of hell in our preaching. We don't need to water down the message to save their feelings. Yeah. We need to warn them about the hog pen. Amen. Yep. Amen. And if they drift off and go into that hog pen, we need to quit trying to rescue them and justify their actions. I still think shacking up's wrong. <coughs> mm -hmm. I still think it's wrong to have kids out of wedlock. Right. You say, preacher, that's awful, that's terrible. I had nothing to do with what I was going to talk about. No, but the Lord laid it on my heart, so you're getting it. Amen? And until we start standing up and saying it out loud to our children that are doing it, yeah. that are doing it, as long as we say, oh, everybody else is doing it, you're fine. This is, you know, we're in 2024. That's old archaic, that's that. It's still Bible. Right. It's still right or wrong. We still need to call it like it is because if we keep air conditioning the hog pen, we're going to lose them to the hog pen. Yep. They'll never repent. They have no reason to. <clears throat> We've air conditioned it. <laughs> we're providing for them while they're in the hog pen. The, the, the prodigal's father didn't, didn't go down there to the hog pen and send them food. The prodigal's father was hurting. Yes, he was. And he was looking for him. It's evident because he saw him while he was yet a great ways off. Coming home. He, he was hurting. But at the same time, he knew what was best. He's going to have to hit bottom before he comes to his senses. Mm. Mm. And you know what's sad? That's the way we are. I wonder, I, I wonder how many times my mama worried about me. <laughs> when I was out chasing the hog pens. You understand what I'm saying? We're all there. All right. But anyway, let's keep going. I don't know. I didn't have time for it. But anyway, let's keep going. Uh, the particulars, three chapters, 73 verses, 2,034 words. Uh, key chapter 12 because it calls for repentance. So let's move on to the purpose now. Number two, the purpose was to warn of judgment. It was, call, it was to call Judah to repent. Uh, it also describes the day of the Lord, the events coming forth from the day of the Lord. Joel gives us details about the events of the day of the Lord. It talks about the regathering of Israel. In the Old Testament, God's dealing with the Jews. The Jews rejected him. We will not have this man reign over us. They rejected it, crucified him, so now he's scattered among the Gentiles to the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. They're scattered among the nations. They are slowly being regathered now, but there's still more Jews in New York than there are in Jerusalem. You understand what I'm saying? There, we're witnessing them going back, but they ain't being gathered. But during the tribulation, he's really going to gather them home. And that's what jo Joel was talking about that. When they come back into their nation during the tribulation, that's what he's talking about, how they're going to be regathered. He's going to talk about the judgment of the nations, the millennial blessings that follows. It's amazing what's in this little book. But anyway, let's move on to the pictures. The pictures. What can we see in the book of Joel? Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 2. I will also gather all nations, and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they, and they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. I'm not going to get to anything, but uh, 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 
I ain't, I ain't gonna get into it, but I do want to do something someday on the sexual trafficking and stuff of our children that's going on today. <clears throat> and this almost alluded to right there in that verse. Mm -hmm. You cannot get around this book. It knows before before any horror comes up, it's already talked about it in the Bible. We just don't see it yet. Yeah. It's there though. It's there. But anyway, here's the picture I wanted you to see. I will gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. At the end of the tribulation, all the nations are going to gather together under the Antichrist to fight against God. He's going to gather them all together in Jehoshaphat. Then when the Lord comes back, He's going to be back with us, His army behind Him. He's going to have a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, the Word of God. He's going to speak. He isn't going to have to fight. He isn't wielding a sword. He's simply going to speak and slaughter everybody in his path in that valley. And then he's going to gather the nations together after that battle of Armageddon, Matthew 25, at the judgment of the nations. So here's what I wanted to show you. This is, there's seven judgments. Everybody thinks there's one, one judgment. You, you, your good works go on one side of the scale and your bad works in the other and whichever outweighs the other is determined whether you go to heaven or hell. That's the world view. That's the Hollywood view. That's the perverted view. The Bible clearly teaches seven judgments and here they are. The first one is sin. In 1 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was made sin for us. Jesus became sin and bare our <clears throat> sin on the cross. All sin. I wasn't even born yet. I wasn't even born to out here. You say, well, I, how, how can my sin be I, I paid for? His blood is powerful. It's, it, the innocent blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. So sin was paid for right there. If you accept that payment, your sin's covered. If you reject that payment, then you have to pay for them. And you'll pay for them for all eternity in hell because your blood's not perfect. It's not going to be, you're going to come up wanting. You're going to be, you're not, your funds are insufficient. <laughs> Does that make sense now? <laughs> But anyway, the second one is here. It's in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31. I know the context is the Lord's Supper, but it also says if we judge ourselves, He won't have to. If we'll get our sins right, if we'll get it right now, He won't have to. If we'll judge what we're doing wrong, He won't have to judge us for it. We can judge ourselves. That's self-judgment. Sin, self-judgment right now in the day in which we live. If you sin... After you get saved, yes, it's paid for. It's under the blood, but you're going to pay for it. Just because you're sealed eternally doesn't give you a free reign to live any way you want to. Amen. So then third is the judgment seat of Christ. You'll find that in Romans 14.10. That is for believers only. All who have accepted Jesus Christ during the church age goes up right there. And we get a glorified body fashion like unto his. That's at the judgment seat of Christ. I've covered all this. Number four is the nation of Israel. It is a national, national. Matthew 24 talks about it. And what this judgment is, is a tribulation. They rejected their Messiah. So he's going to send them the Antichrist. And they'll follow him. He come in the Father's name and they received him not. Another come in his own name, him they will receive. And they'll follow that Antichrist and he's going to judge them during that time. That is for the nation of Israel. Then, number five, is the judgment of the nations that Job's going to talk about and give us some details about. But what it does, all the nations that fight against Israel are going to be at that judgment. All the nations that try to help Israel during that time. Because in Revelations chapter 6 through 19, you can read about the horror that they're going to go through. The devil's going to try to wipe them off the face of the earth. They are going to suffer like they've never suffered during the tribulation. And the nations that help them will be the sheep nations that go into the millennium. And the goat nations that butted heads with them and butted against them, they're going to be cast into hell. That's Matthew chapter 25. And you see details about that in Job. 
And then in the first Corinthians six, three, know ye not ye shall judge angels. At the end of all this, we're going to judge angels. Don't ask me to explain that. I can't. But according to the Word of God, God's going to use the saints of God to judge angels. And then the last one will be also after the end of it all uh, will be the Revelations chapter 20, 11 through 13. That's going to be number seven, the great white throne. That's where the dead from all ages, death and hell, give up the dead which are in them and they will be judged and be cast into hell. That's when that takes place. Now, I've, st I've covered that and gave much more detail on that before, but that's the picture you're going to get. We're going to get this picture right here, the judgment of the nations, number five, and the, the tribulation and the trouble they're going to go through there, and the restoration and the millennium, the blessings that follow when they're restored. That's where we're at in the book of Joel. Now you say, why do you say that? Because the Charismatics misuse this book. They, they, they try to make it sound like it's something that it's not. Uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to give you that verse. We're here. Uh, chapter 2, verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, the palmer, palmer worm, my great army, which I sin among you. They say, God's going to restore to you all the years, all the prosperity, all the bad years of health you've had. God's going to restore your health tenfold. And all the years of struggling financially, He's going to restore tenfold. See, that's they misusing it. He's talking to Israel how He's going to restore to them in the millennium. They're going to suffer through the tribulation, but the blessing's coming. Amen? So that's what that's going on there. Uh, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And uh, it goes on to say, your young men shall see visions. How many of you have heard them prophesy talking about how the Joel talks about how we're going to see visions and you're going to dream. And, and they're trying to apply, apply that to the church age today. We clearly, in context, it's talking about during the tribulation, how God's going to let them see visions and stuff, and they're going into the millennium. That is the context of Joel. To try to apply today, they're, 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 they've lost it. They've lost it. If you don't believe that, keep reading. Look at verse 29. And also upon the service upon the handmaids of those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens. Where's the wonders in the heavens right now? And in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Where's that at? They claim that's for today, but it's not. That's going to be during. But look at verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Does that not sound like the book of Revelation? What's going on during the tribulation? And the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. When the Lord comes back, He's coming back and blood's going to flow down that valley 200 and some miles. And it's going to be the depth of a horse's bridle. All the armies of the world is going to come, come into that area to fight against Israel, to fight against God. And when he comes down, he's just going to tread on like a wine press. That's what it talks about. It talks about how the blood will be to the horse's bridle. He's going to slaughter his enemies. That's a loving God, ain't it? Amen. A loving God to take your enemies out of your way. Yep. Amen. And eventually he's going to at the end of the millennium when he when when Satan, death and uh, death and hell and everything's done with. Amen. As far as we're concerned. But let's keep going here. Let me give you let's run through the book right quick with what little time I have left. Oh, there was so much more I wanted to give you. But anyway. I broke it down into three things. You see the desolation in chapter 1 where he starts talking about that lo those locusts, how they come in and swarm in and everything. Now, let's look at it. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Have it been in your days? Or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. You know, we're only one generation away from losing Christianity in America. Yep. One generation. When we fail to convey the truths of the Word of God 
to their children, the next generation, what are they going to tell their kids? If we drop the ball, guess what? They're not going to have one to pick up to give their kids. But I promise you, this world will give them something to give to them. They'll make the hog pen look real good for them. Amen. That which the pommel worm hath left, the locust hath eaten. And that which the locust hath left, the canker worm eat, eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all ye drunkards of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Watch. For a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number. Ah! He's using a locust, a plague of locusts to show us something. He lets us know that not only is this a historic account of locusts destroying the land like they've never seen before, but there's going to be a nation come in like those locusts and they're going to carry them off. And they're going to eat and destroy everything. That's what he's showing you. For a nation has come upon my land. That's, that's Israel. Strong and without number. And it talks about their teeth, their teeth of lion, and hath cheek, teeth of a great lion. And look at this. He hath laid my vine waste. We know from Isaiah that the vine is Israel. The vine is Israel. So he's talking about Israel. Now watch this. And bark my fig tree. We know the fig tree is a picture of Israel. In the Bible it talks about how the fig tree, you know, learn the parable of the fig tree. When it brings forth its fruit, it's talking about Israel. So we know that's the fig tree. So you're starting to see he's talking about the future when Assyria is going to come in and carry them off. Assyria is going to do that to the northern ones, and it's going to be Babylon to the south. And notice how he gave you the stages of, uh, of what the canker worm did, eat, the pommel worm did, and what the locust did. It gave you four different steps. How many stages was Israel carried off? Three. Four, if you count the northern part. So they were carried off. He's telling them. Uh, let's see, for time's sake, I'm going to move on. But you can see uh, under the desolation, you see the announcement. Then you see the agents. He talks about the palm worm, the locusts, and the caterpillars and everything. <laughs> and, and, and we see the problems. All of it is, has been because... They haven't listened. Ah, verse 15 in chapter 1. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, as a mighty destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And again, talking about the day of the Lord. You know what the most important day is in the Bible? June 9th, 1992. When James Keever got saved. Amen. Woo! Ain't that the most precious thing? No. James Keever's nobody. He's a, he's a nobody on the backside of nowhere. A nothing. But what, what is precious in God's sight is the day that Jesus gets the glory due him. When he gets to sit on the throne. When he gets recognized as King of kings and Lord of lords. When his enemies are put under him. When he squashes his enemy, he sets up his rule, his kingdom, his throne, getting the glory he deserves. There's the day of the Lord. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day is what Peter said, remember? Yeah. How long is the millennium? A thousand years. That's, that's the day of the Lord. Now, it encompasses a little more time than that because it's building up to the day of the Lord in the book of Joel. But that's a good way to remember the day of the Lord to help you get a picture of that. What's more important? Amen? Now, you have the day of Christ spoken of also in the Bible. And it's slightly different. It encompasses when He gets His bride. The rapture of the church. So the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are kind of two different things, but they go together. Okay, I'll maybe do a study on that one time. But anyway, so first of all, we see the desolation. We see they're in a mess. Then we're going to see the, the description in chapter 2. In chapter 2, 
He starts talking about the day of the Lord, and he starts talking about the, uh, you know, you have the alarm there. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as morning spreads upon the mountains, and a great people and strong, and hath not... Now, now look, it's talking about clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong there hath not ever been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even the years of many generations. Uh, it talks about fire devouring them in verse 3 and verse 4. The appearance of them are as the appearance of horses and as horsemen they shall run. In the book of Revelation, does it not talk about the four horsemen? Oh my goodness, I would love to tell you something and it'll blow your mind. Uh, why did God use, you know, those four horses are four different colors? They're, they're pale green, red, black, right? They're green. You know, look around Israel. Look at the flags of those nations. Red, black, green. All around them. That's the color of their flags. Ain't it funny? That's the color of the horsemen in the Bible. I mean, it's amazing. You look at their flags. And that's like, you can't get around this book. You can't get around it. But anyway, let's keep going here. You see the alarm, the appearance. It talks about the army in verse 11. Uh, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. That's us. After the marriage supper of the Lamb, after the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we come back with Jesus. We're coming back. We're the army that comes back with him at the second advent. We're following him, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, then you have the assembly where he calls for them to repent. And then, of course, the answer, you know, they, they don't repent. Uh, I've read you some of that verses, those verses already. Now let's move on to the deliverance. The deliverance, chapter 3. In chapter 3, uh, I'm out of time, but what you see is Armageddon. Look at verse... One, for, for behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah, he's gathering all of them together again, and Jerusalem, I will also <laughs> gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And parted my land. There's that peace treaty they keep trying to get Israel to sign. Land for peace. Land for, it's their land. Why do they need to give land to their enemy so they don't attack them? Right. It's my land. I ain't giving you land so you don't attack me. You attack me, I'm going to blow your head off. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. But anyway, here's the battle of Armageddon the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then you go down, verse 7. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither I have sold them and return, uh, return your recompense upon your own head. The nations that have been have treated Israel bad, God's going to turn it back on them. Verse 9. Proclaim this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither, cause my, thy, not, thy mighty ones, uh, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be weakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. There is Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations. After he comes down and he destroys his enemies, he's going to gather all the nations together in that valley and he's going to judge them right there. Those that have been good to Israel during their time, during the tribulation, they are going into the millennium alive. They get to go in there alive. The curse will be lifted. They're going to live during the great, one of the greatest times this world's ever known. Jesus will be on the throne. The curse will be lifted and they'll get to live during that time. That'll be amazing. That'll be amazing. Now, and then afterwards, now look, it talks about 15. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, the stars shall withdraw their shining, the Lord shall roar out of Zion. There's the second coming. 
Verse 18, And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and, and shall water the valley of Shittim. And what we get into here, we're seeing that he's taking them into the millennium. Verse 20, uh, but Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So basically, what you're getting a picture of is them going into the millennium, the blessings, him restoring them. All right, I'm out of time. Any questions real quickly? All right, there's the book of Joel. Oh, three chapters, but man, is it not loaded. All right. Father, Lord, again, thank you for the blessings. I pray, Lord, you just be with us and help us, Lord, as we go about our day, Lord, just trying to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.